Hello everybody, welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I have an 11 by 15 quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua in front of me. And we're going to do a fast and loose swamp watercolor painting on it. So, I live stream these videos on Twitch. So there will be um, kind of a delay in the beginning where I'm just doing a little bit of setup up of the palette and maybe talking about what colors I might use. And then the actual painting will start in probably about three to five minutes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to um, skip ahead. Also, um, be prepared that I might randomly say hello or you know talk to somebody. And that's because the live stream is there and it allows people to interact real time and ask questions and to just come hang out. So with that being said, I am taking a large hake brush. This is to get that paper soaked. I like to paint wet and wet, especially at the beginning. And I have a one of those cheap Kindles right there that lets me um, see the film in real time. It lets me know if there's any errors with it. So I'll be honest, it seems like it does give a little bit of trouble at times. It's like right now it says that it knows that I'm streaming, but it doesn't quite want to bring the video up. There we go. I'll eventually have to upgrade that. So Amazon's been having deals on the Kindle's HD 8, about $50. But then of course you got to get a case, you got to get a um, screen protector and all that. Like <laughs> the Kindles that I have around and, and the Kindles are great for like photo references for um, downloading cheap eBooks with um, paintings from famous artists, things like that. But um, having them on the painting table, you definitely want to uh, make sure they have the covers, um, screen protectors. This one's splattered with paint. This one, on this way, the cats got in here once when I had oil paint out. And they tracked oil paint on top of um, that screen. But I was able to wipe it off. Okay, so... I got the butcher tray. Just lets me mix in the middle and I just have these colors on the side. Um, I try to maintain a pretty basic palette for these videos. Um, the content, the title, we kind of call this palette the, the Ron Ranson palette. He was um, a big proponent of fast and loose painting. He died, I want to say maybe two or three years ago. There's a lot of books out there, some videos. We have a um, Facebook page dedicated to painting in his style. Um, but the palette's pretty basic. And I'll mention the colors as we go around. And it's kind of also in the vein of Edward Wesson or... James Fletcher Watson, if you have watercolor books, watercolor videos, those are people that um, utilize this. It may actually be time to get a new tube of um, Ultramarine. I must have thrown that one away. So paint wise, and I'll kind of talk about that while I get everything ready and make a little bit of a mess. I use the uh, mainly the Vin Da Vinci brand watercolors. I get them off of Blick.com. I started using Jerry's Artorama lately for other watercolor stuff or art stuff in general. But um. 
They both seem to be equally priced. But Ultramarine Blue, I definitely have gone through a few tubes of that. I think I'd started with the small um, Van Gogh brand or um, Cotman brand, the 8 milliliter or the 10 milliliter tubes. And then quickly got a lot of these, uh, the 37 milliliters. I'd probably get them for about 10 bucks. Which is, it, it's a big investment, but if you keep a minimum pallet, it helps. Let's see if there's anything else we want to put out. Just throw some alizarin and crimson out. I'm not sure if we'll use it, but kind of freshen that up. Even throw some light red oxide out there. I find that light red oxide is something that I definitely don't go through quickly. I think because of the opacity of it, how strong it is. Anyway, so the paper is wet. Right, you can see how it's kind of buckling up in the um, live stream in the video. You can see the shadow that it casts right there because of the buckling. So you just push the clips down and help that out. There's different ways to stretch paper. Um, one method that appears a lot, and I mentioned Facebook pages earlier, the Ron Ranson Disciples. So I'll mention other ones. Um, watercolor tips and tricks. I think somebody had posted their method of stretching, which was soaking the paper in a tub, either the sink or like a, literally a tub for five minutes, then stapling it to their board. I'm not sure if they just then remove the staples at the end or use it in that fashion. Some people go with the uh, five, 300 pound paper, which is like heavy cardstock, less prone to um, buckling, I believe, and the bending. But that's, um, you know, then you, then you start making financial decisions with that because those could get pretty expensive. These guys for a sheet, after I buy them in bulk, are about $4 a sheet, so it breaks me down in price. And it's 140 pound paper. And since I paint fast and loose, I usually can, the paper can usually handle what I'm doing with it. If I painted in a um, meticulous style, or it's just like very, realistic or very in-depth there might be uh some issues i just don't know so anyway enough rambling let's start painting so i think this one's a gonna be a swamp painting i'm gonna take raw sienna you'll find out in almost every single one of these videos i'll start out with raw sienna this is a very common beginning for fast and loose paintings especially in landscape painting. A lot of painters will utilize that. Then I'll grab just the tiniest bit of ultramarine. And right now, since there's no pigment on the paper, I could do really light washes, wet and wet. But if I already had pigment there, and then I was to add more, I would start getting um, cauliflower effect and start having issues. Now, sky-wise, I'm going very light, very gentle, because I'm going to build up a lot of uh, trees and whatnot. So this is the medium hake. Something's knocking into something I'm bringing. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can put a little bit of Payne's Gray. All right, and that's all we're gonna do for kind of just the sky and whatnot. Now, we'll come up with kind of a compositional idea. It's gonna be one that I've used before, but 
don't know if I've really filmed and took this um, scenic approach to it. So we'll do a horizon line back here. Not that we're going to see much of it. We'll have a waterway come through here. And then it'll pass in front. And open up. Then we're going to work our way back to forward. Usually, we'll take a light red oxide and ultramarine and this is easy for just you know making up things or if you need something to recede back so it's kind of a go-to formula for me however I'm gonna switch up my formula in a moment so I'm gonna go higher than usual for this background tree line I really want to get the feeling of being immersed and engulfed in this swamp as we build it up. Kind of just like a wetland. Now on top of that, I'm going to take some raw sienna and put that in. Really just tr trying to go for variety and changing things up. So this gives us a different perspective. It lets us see things differently compared to how we usually um, just do that um, background purple receding. Now, a few things to keep in mind. As you add pigment in, you wanna increase the pigment load and decrease the water quantity reason you do that is to prevent the um, backwashes that can take place. So here I have the number four rigger and I'm going to do something that might not show through in the final product and I don't know if we've done these in a while but we'll just take the number four rigger you could use the number one rigger you can use the squirrel mop if you have the light enough hand for it to put some vertical trees. And this is the Payne's Gray. Now a few things you want to keep in mind here. With this, it's wet and wet, so it's going to diffuse. It's wet and wet, so and it's Payne's Gray, which dries way lighter. It's also going to be in the background with a lot of things layered on top. So we might not really see any of this at the end, but it helps us build up the effect. So those are all ideas that you want to keep in mind. We could also start playing around if we wanted to. The concept of like a far background big tree. But we're just going to keep on um, building these up. So this is kind of just using it almost like a fan brush or um, dotting it in that fashion and feeding that pigment in. So let's go back to the hake. And I got Payne's Gray on the brush, which what I should do is try to move away from that. I personally really prefer dark paintings, mooding paintings, um, where I essentially am utilizing mud for the painting. But let's um, let's try to short switch it up a little bit. Even though we're in a swamp, which will have the muddy dark effect to it. So this is kind of the raw siennas, the sienna mixed up for a different color. So now here I'm adding another layer closer to us. So I'm going to consider this to be the base of it, the bottom of it. 
uh, perspective wise, since it's getting closer, it's lower. However, since it's further far away, the gap is pretty small. If I was to do another tree line, it'll be a bigger gap and that'll create a sense of um, perspective. Okay, so if something's far away, but getting a little bit closer, just have a small drop in it. And this will be the opening for the water. Okay, so um, right now this layer is kind of uh, monochromatic where I have just the one color there. So we'll feed other colors into it. We'll try to get texture and variety. You'll see that we're covering over parts of that background area. Um, high parts on this one, meaning like the height of a bush or a tree, will be higher than, in general, than the ones in the background. There could be ones that are higher than it, like this kind of like faint effect. But it's kind of just a generalization to help things um, start taking place. You could even here build up a darker pigment and feed that in, similar to the fashion we did that further background. We have a stronger pigment, so it will hopefully have a darker effect, but we want to keep in mind once again, stronger pigment so that it um, doesn't cause cauliflowers. However, Payne's gray or the darks in general will um, dry lighter. And being that we're wet and wet, it's going to um, diffuse in that fashion. Now, like I said in the beginning, so this is originally going to be live streamed on Twitch and somebody just came in. Um, we have visual in the live stream. How you doing? And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, I mean, and this videos will kind of talk about anything if anybody wants to come in and chat but if they have questions about art um and sometimes i'll even throw things to the um to the viewer to the live person if they want um anything done differently you know for example if i'm like hey do you want me to do a tree do you want me to use gouache do you want me to use a white um do you want me to experiment but we're still working on this layer and we're just darkening this up. This is, once again, wet and wet. And most of the painting is going to be done with the painter paper being wet. Um, kind of in a fast and loose style. So things to watch for are the gradual um, softening of these colors. If I use a blow dryer, you would see the extreme softening that takes place. If you ever drop something on it, there you go. It's fixed. In fact, if you really wanted to, we could start bringing that area out as a um, source of light. In the, the video, I don't know if that'll show up that much. Anywho, so this is a secondary layer. You can see very quickly that it's softening and that the layer that it went in front of essentially is hidden. Um, but what that does is if you were to pick through and look at those spots, you can see a little bit of it. So it just gives you that illusion. And it also lets you create an imaginary world with it. Um, by the time I kind of do that second layer, I'll play around with maybe a potential edge of a streamline. And I'll be honest, with painting, it's very easy to fa uh, fall into very you know common um, compositions, especially if it's a composition you've done before. And I am very fond of the s shape composition and we're going to try to um, you know push it more towards the swamp in a bit but right now the white would be the water 
and you see how it comes over and it kind of recedes back. And my approach to the foreground trees and the midground trees are going to be very swampy. In fact, one thing you can do when we put this land in, you can leave gaps, a dry brush effect, and go for the idea of water being filled over it. If your paper starts to dry, you know, feel free to re-wet it. A few things to keep in mind. Whenever you're doing streams, like we have right here, as it comes out towards you, you're going to want it to widen out. reason we do that is um, for perspective. And if you did in reverse, it would look like the water is actually flowing up into the page as opposed to flowing and coming out towards us. Um, very good painter, Eric Kopel. And when I say very good paper, that is an under, a painter. That's an understatement. He is um, a modern master of the Hudson River Valley movement. And he paints in um, oil paint. And when he was doing his stream and putting something in, he was like, you want to think horizontal movements to shape it? Because in essence, it's a horizontal plane receding into it. And those horizontal marks help create that plane. So it's just, um, I don't know. Uh, I think I read a quote somewhere once that was like, painting's a lot of little lies for one big truth, or a lot of it, truths for one big lie. I don't know. Okay, uh, also, while it's wet and wet, I'm just going to spritz some extra water there. I like to uh, make sure my shadows get put in, or the reflections from the uh, trees above. Mainly because... The wet and wet gives us that diffused effect. That watery shadow would have. And one thing I always mention with shadows, don't mimic the exact image. Don't do a perfect reflection of it. Uh, first and foremost, people that do that are, first of all, they're, they're very amazing. They do a great job when that takes place. And the skill and talent that those people have is phenomenal. And I don't have that skill. But that's not the reason I'm saying don't do that. The reason I'm saying that is, and um, this is one thing that I read somewhere that had rung very true with me, was that when you uh, do something like that, if you have that perfect image above and then below, you're creating essentially two images on one painting. And um, it makes it difficult to read or enjoy in the long term, which um, may not be the best sense. But if you're in any art groups or anything like that, look around on Facebook or at reflections or things like that and try to keep that in mind. I saw somebody who did it once and they did it perfectly where the water line was up here. So it was just a hint of what was taking place and the whole reflection was there. So it had just one image on the painting, on the paper itself, as opposed to two images, which was a great way of doing it. So this is the Payne's Gray mix. And as the paper dries and as you practice and as you paint, you'll get used to the different stages. You'll see that you're able to do um, different textures. You're able to get different effects as that paper, uh, paper dries. And there's really no way to um, to do it except for to, to just practice um, and see how the different wet and wet stages affect it. Now, I want this to be more swampy. So I might leave the water white in that fashion and get that hazy look. Um, you could play around with colors in the sky and bring those reflections down. You could also play around with general colors. Here we have a raw sienna and play around with some raw siennas like that. 
I do, I am bringing this reflection down. That's to stop the eye from going off the page right there. But I have to be careful with choking the thickness here to make sure I still have that um, narrowing taking place. Okay, so we're still wet and wet. Um, number four rigger, raw sienna, sorry, burnt sienna. It, it, at this point, I always wind up just taking my earth tones and start mixing it with Payne's gray. And um, you see that splatter there. It's all good, I'll just lift it out. Where was I? Okay, and I'll just start getting mixtures for darks. Um, and that's just kind of the way I go with this wet and wet stage. You can choose to dry off and put these in and I'm going to put some tree trunks and structures in and you want to be wary or cognizant of the fact that you're going to get diffusions taking place if you're going wet and wet. So this is where it's kind of like make your decision and what effect you want and I'm just doing this because honestly there's no real artistic reason why I'm choosing to do these guys wet and wet I may um, just put another layer in after this with um, by drying off we'll see now a few things since I'm putting in more solid tree structures um, at this level at this stage I like to put more shadows at their base this helps them ground in place and kind of not um, fly off think about a fence or a um, fire hydrant or a lamp post or anything like that look at the base and you'll always see kind of overgrowth grass around the bottom of it Unless you're my grandfather, who was like really meticulous about um, cutting that in yard work. But look at those, and you'll see a growth at the bottom. And I find that that helps these guys sit in place. You could also play with the rigger. This is the number four. Uh, you could grab the number one, and that will help with um, kind of thin um, effects. You can also, I'm just taking a little bit of water here because I put a dot up in the sky accidentally. Hopefully that doesn't ruin the whole sky, but we'll see. Um, you can see that it's coming from here. If we think of the light source, if we think about um, reflections and shadows, if we go directly below it, a shadow would come straight towards me. As we go out to the side, shadows are going to radiate out from that point so here would be that shadow here would be that shadow so all those lines have that linear the shadows have that linear or linear linear <laughs> perspective taking place we also have their reflections taking place and now i know this sounds silly but you don't have to put all your shadows in all the reflections in um, which probably sounds contrary to um, most rules and it's probably not really a rule it's kind of just um, how much you want to put in and see what you know you prefer let's put some wet and wet structures here we're even going to play with their foliage um, I have a tendency to kind of hook off for my branches and whatnot. One thing that you want to be aware of, and one thing that I make a mistake of very easily, is let's say I have a hook right here. I have a hook that's very close right here. I want to make sure that I don't want to do a hook right next to it. Um, vary their starting points. Okay. Once again, ground them in place with um, some overgrowth. Look at your source of light. 
and do your shadows. Um, as you play around with shadows more and more, we have a little bit of reflection and that little bit of water right there. As you play around with shadows, it doesn't have to be a perfect straight line. It could, let me see if I can do this here and kind of squiggle it. And that squiggle will give the effect of a rise and fall, um, a bumpiness to the land that it's casting over. Okay. Now, let's go back to the Hake brush. All right, so we're going for Swamp. Uh, there's nothing really specifying that's a swamp. It's just um, going to be the overgrowth and the water. Lemon yellow, my arch nemesis. I'm getting corrupted in the red direction by the light red oxide right next to it. I'm trying to pull a little bit of the lemon yellow. on a kind of frayed hake. Now don't be worried about like messing up your brushes. This one I've had for about two years now and I paint like this almost every day with it. And you know, it's, it's probably about time to retire it. I kind of mentioned in the past few videos and I do have one to replace it, but um, I don't know, let's say hypothetically I spent $15 on it. $15 for two years, that's great. And if I um, ta-ta it, then I, I run the risk of not painting to the full potential. Does that make sense? Where if you're going to... Um, be worried about damaging it or you know you, you know, you're not going to use it to its full effect which seems contrary to how we live you know a normal life because I'm sure and I'm not a car guy but if you were to you know have a car and you know a very expensive one that's supposed to be able to go really fast and you're out there going really fast with it I'm sure you're probably putting some wear and tear on it. Same thing with, um, you know, firearms. If you have a something that's in a, in a Magnum load, like a 44 Magnum or a 357 Magnum, and you're just putting, it's called a, like a hot round through it nonstop, you're, um, you are putting wear and tear on that. Then again, those are you know hundred dollar things or you know cars thousands of dollars, where brush is fifteen dollars. I'm liking how light it's coming through in the video. Um, we definitely have diffusion in different spots. There's some areas that the paper is a little bit drier. I think one day I want to try gold green or um, olive green. I think those would be fun colors. Let's see. Let's um. So let's get a little dark for a little bit of small twigs. Now, um, with this in mind, whenever you put in foliage in this fashion. Even if it was dry and I just put it in, it's now wet in those spots. So if I put something in, I'm trying to give you an example. I'm going to do a dot. You'll see how it's diffusing into it. So if I was to do more foliage on top of that, I may want to dry it off or I can do a wet and wet effect. Um, and here is kind of around the time when you start making the decision, do I want to do a dry off? I'm taking the number one rigger and just playing around with it. And uh, 
essentially biding my time just thinking, what do I want to do next? Oh, hey, how's it going, Raz? Um, so we have our uh, friend from uh, Canada, right? Up in the live chat. How you been? How's everything going? Today, we're doing a video, a wet and wet, of course. Um, I titled it kind of a swamp scene, but it's kind of a more autumn, uh, end of the day stream type scene. Demonstrating wet and wet, uh, talking about um, diffusion and whatnot. Okay, so that's good to hear. Um, so last time we were talking about, um, I think we were talking about panhandling, um, and how and how you got you just were panhandling up in Canada. You really had nothing much else to do. Um, nothing much is new down here. Uh, Monday, we go back for five days of um, just teachers being at the school, just prepping. Um, for school and whatnot. And besides that, not too much. Just been doing a lot of oil painting. And I feel like I haven't done a video in a while. I'm not going to lie. I was really school, um, stressed out about, um, about work starting up and how things were looking due to, you know, COVID and all that. Okay, so you're panning for rocks and maybe tiny, tiny gold. Did you find any gold? Did you find any rocks? Uh, let me do a dry off real quick. Um, and since we're talking about wet and wet, there is some areas that are still wet. So look and see if there's any um, softening that takes place. And that's the main thing you always want to keep in mind with watercolors. So here we go. And if you have earbuds on, watch your ears. So, um, as you can see, I was touching with the back of my hands. Some areas uh, feel cool. Um, that means it's not completely dry, but we wouldn't really have too much of a diffusion taking place. Um, and I did this so that now I can do kind of a crisp, stark layer of trees. And with uh, these tutorials, hopefully... Hopefully at times they seem a little repetitive and it might seem contrary to the fact, but um, there's only a few things you really have to keep in mind when you're painting, um, or at least for me, you know, you find the things that will hold true for you. In this case, one of the things that I, I, always, I always talk about is that if I'm going to put another layer of trees in, or if I put more lines in this spot, I can pass over the existing lines if I wanted to embolden them or I can offset and do other ones or ones that are closer and that'll help build up my um, density and thickness of that area. So decide for yourself what you want to have take place. Do you, I want these ones to pop out or do I want two or three closer trees and have these guys sit behind it? Do I want to add density and dimension to this line right here? So keep all those things in mind. So when you are panning, 
he found corpolite, fossilized dinosaur poop. It's tiny, but you can see the, the texture. You faceted the flat face. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, I, I would think that panning would be so much fun regardless of the results kind of like going fishing and just getting out the house um what was your name on um instagram again is it is it raz on instagram now while i do this one i want to make sure that i pay attention to my um my branches and how they they go off because this is going to be what sits forward i'm going to help this guy sit in place yeah i'm gonna to have to check uh instagram to see that fossilized um dinosaur poop that's really cool um i I'm not the best with social media with like going through Instagram and seeing what everybody's posted. So I apologize for that. Um, which I need to do more of. I've been kind of thinking to myself now, this is probably the point of the painting where I'm going to get a little bit of philosophical while I line these out. And I apologize for that during the tutorial and the live stream, but there was a few things sitting heavy on my mind. Maybe I'll, get you guys thinking or have your input on it. So speaking of social media, I was thinking, you know, man, I just got to keep social media for art and just, you know, friendships and all that, you know, just seeing how everybody's doing and seeing what people are producing. Um, you know, cause it's really fun and I really like the art communities. Uh, and the reason I was thinking just solely for those purposes is that you see, the, the best way to phrase it is just the, um, God, the hatred and the arguments and the, uh, what's the word? Is it vitriol that's taking place on like Facebook and other stuff like that? And I'm not going to lie, I've, I've fallen into those things. And, um, you know, part of me is this thinking, and if I could use just art for that, uh, social media for, for art, you know? And, um, and I was like scrolling through like Facebook and I was just thinking, oh, you know, I got to like almost meditate, you know, like close my mind off and not think about this stuff. And then I had like my epiphany. I was like, is meditating just, um, just bottling stuff up? I was like, am I doing long-term damage to my, my mental health by, by meditating? Is that the same thing as bottling things? Anyway, yeah, so that's the philosophical point of the live stream today in this video. Back to the painting. <laughs> I don't know what y'all think of that. Here, I'm taking this, um, the number four brush, and I'm doing a dry brush side effect. That kind of goes back to what we were talking about with brushes earlier. This is the number four um, silver black velvet rigger, or script brush. What do they call it? script. Those names are usually interchangeable between um, different brushes of, of the same purpose. Originally, they were for the thin lines on the, um, the rigging of sails. So that's where that comes from. Um, and this is probably a $10, $20 brush. The number one has been used for the same amount of years as this guy right here. So they last you a long time. Oh, uh, Razatron, if you want to put, I, I, there's really, I don't think much other people in the live chat, but if you want to post a link to your um, Instagram in there, you can, you can go ahead and do that. Now I'm just putting a bigger tree on this side. Um, a few things you want to keep in mind compositionally. 
is a variety of uh, numbers of objects and the spacing between them. I might just put one tree on this side with its little branch off. The number four holds a lot to it. Oh, um, Raz, I, I bought a new brush off of uh, Instagram, not Instagram, uh, Amazon. This was $20, free shipping. It was a Paul Rubens number six um, squirrel mop, which I've been using. I didn't use it all on this one, but that's a it's a fun brush. I think Hammy or Harrison scratching at the door. One of the cats. Oh yeah, the mop, um, I mean, honestly, for $20, I can't imagine it gets any better. Um, just dipping it in the water, and you can see the point that it comes to. And if you're somebody that has a, a light hand, I can imagine you can get pretty, you could probably get lines about that thin or maybe thinner. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, the whole that side brushing effect is phenomenal with it. It's something I need to practice. Um, I think we're talking about what Alan Owen and um, was it Alan Owen and David Usher have mastered that skill in their YouTube videos? Yeah, Alan Owen, David, which. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's definitely the, the couple different ways to do foliage. Um, with these trees being so close and having so much foliage in them, and I feel like I've seen David Usher do it. I don't know if Alan Owen has uh, done this. I use the hake. And I do it kind of dry for these. I don't know if it's possible or... Raz could probably tell us, is it possible to to do the foliage with the mop uh, dry brushing for something this close and this big? And uh, what we're talking about is taking the brush and doing a side effect, much like we did with the rigger here. But I just, I'm not sure if it's possible to do it or foliage in this fashion that's this close and this big of an area. But if you like watercolor and you like fast and loose painting, those are two guys you definitely want to check out. Alan Owen and David Usher. They're two people that I uh, pretty much wet, wet, wet my teeth on fast and loose painting. Yeah, so whereas yeah, we're not we're not sure if it's really capable the um the squirrel mop for this close of foliage. That might be something um to dedicate a video to to see if we can do that. I um I had done an introductory video the first day I opened it. If it looks like you say loose style for the first or second layer. So you're thinking, um, kind of mop it in loosely and then use the hake. Is that what you're thinking? I'm going to build up the darker spots near the bottom. Yeah. So um, with this approach to kind of clarify for those of you watching at a later date, we kind of thinking along the same lines that we could take a mop brush and essentially mass in or um, maybe dry brush in a second layer while we're wet and wet or maybe even dry and then take the hake 
and go on top and add this texture in this fashion, which um, I don't know how long Raz has been painting for. And I've been watercoloring for two or three years, so I definitely don't have uh, a lot, a lot of experience. I'm always trying to experiment with new things. But that's, that's I hate to be cliche, but that's that's the magic of watercolor is that there's so many different things you can experiment with. And if you're painting fast and loose like this, you're done in a half hour to an hour, and you could be on to your next experiment. That's also why it's important to find a paper that's good, but affordable. Like the Stonehenge Aqua, I, I, I pay, um, I think I mentioned it earlier, $4 for the large sheet for this size when I buy it in bulk, which for me gives me a, a comfortable quantity to um, experiment with and paint with. So you've been experimenting with watercolor for four years. And um, I don't know if there's ever a point with watercolor where you probably truly learn everything with it. It's um, it definitely lends itself to um, experimentation, which is great. Actually, um, something pretty cool. My friend's son is turning 16 and he is a fantastic piano player and he's only been playing piano for, let's say at this point for a year and he's, he's fantastic. It's, it's not even like me saying that to be like, oh, you know, this kid, the kid is good. This kid's like great. And, um, his birthday is coming up and they have a Facebook invite and they are going to do an in-person and also a live stream recital from his house for his birthday, which I think is really cool. I was going to ask the fiance or so we we going in person or what because you know they needed to find out seating and all that because you know we still all want to be safe and whatnot with uh, COVID and um, you know seating in their house was very limited <laughs> and unfortunately we were we didn't we didn't give an answer in time we didn't decide which one we wanted to do but it looks like we're going to be attending the live stream version of it which is going to be really cool regardless. Um, I went and saw him play his school's Christmas recital. Yeah, he did. Um, I forget, you know, it was Mozart or Beethoven. And like, let's say he started playing in August of last year. Um, if you played, let's say August of last year, by that December, he was playing kind of like eight minute Beethoven Mozart pieces that he had memorized. Um, and it was just like, it, it blew me away. And I was, um, so happy that I went to go see it in person. Um, and that was at his school his school recital. And um, I tutor his younger brother in math and other school uh, subjects. And I would go over there and I'd always be like, okay, so when's the next recital? When's the next recital? And um, I think he also does the plays, but he doesn't play the music for the plays yet. He just acts in them. And I was looking forward to his next recital. But, um, you know, COVID shut everything down. Yeah, and music is, like, really good for mental health. Um, either making music or listening to music. 
you can definitely um, see a change in um, you know people either you know in those two regards. The other night, the fiance was making um, the spaghetti, and she had country music going. And she she really likes the like the old classic country. And you know she's dancing around and all that, and I'm like, you know, the songs, the, all these country songs are just about men and women cheating on each other and wanting to kill each other. <laughs> she's like, yep, classic country is great, isn't it? And I'm just like, um. I'm really looking forward to the spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing you want to be really careful about with these scening scenes, if you wind up painting one, the dancing country music of the '90s. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with the different country music and whatnot, but um, she was listening to Conway Twitty, um, Loretta Lynn, um, Johnny Cash. I'm starting to get to know the names and I can kind of tell by the voices. Uh, there was, was it Tennessee Williams? Ten, but I think, or is that, that, is, that might be a whiskey, Tennessee Williams. Um, the one about something boot scoot and boogie and achy breaky heart billy ray cyrus yeah i think i think she listens to the music from before that from like is the red Lynn still around i don't know if that's the 60s or the 70s classic country i'll have to ask her about those the boot scoot and boogie and achy breaky heart because i'm more classic rock and um you know pink floyd grateful dead stuff like that yeah, I think that name Atkins sounds familiar. There was somebody like that. Let me do a dry off for um, just so we could see that. If you have earbuds on, watch your ears. So I think I lied. It's not so much a swamp scene as it is a interior forest scene. Um, how long into the video are we? But at this point, tutorial wise, um, there you could play around with um, twigs, branches and whatnot. So we're 58 minutes in. Thank you, Raz, appreciate that. So 58 minutes with um, paper prep, palette prep, um, hanging out and talking and whatnot and just thinking about stuff. You can get a, a, a pretty good scene done. Um, and, and all it is is just keeping in mind layering, layering and texture, just working back to forward, uh, building up pigment, um, building up our... Um, clarity of our objects and if you're making up a scene you can use this s-shape composition over and over again and just play around with um the concentration of trees here the trees are honestly they're kind of evenly spaced which is something i genuinely you know try to avoid but you could redo this scene with just one tree right here and leave that blank and see what happens you could do a big oak in this spot and break it up. There's just so much you can do with this technique. Um, and there's also a lot of, um, you could probably apply it to a lot of different scenes in, in photographs and nature, just working your way back to forward. Let's, let's sign it and see what it looks like underneath a mat. And then we'll 
call it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it kind of does. Uh, Raz says that it reminds him of a rainy morning with the sounds of ducks off in the distance. In fact, I'll be honest with the live streams and stuff like that I'm not sure the best way to make things you know special and whatnot but let's call this rainy morning you know that's that's the, the least I can do is let somebody title the painting we'll call it raining morning this is 2020. I'm gonna have to write that there. No, I I appreciate you coming in and um and sharing stuff. And for people in the videos. You might have heard me uh, refer to Raz in other videos, and um, he has offered some awesome insight, and um, we did some awesome experiments with gouache and black paint, and playing with the way light was falling across different scenes. So here this one is underneath the mat. I think it uh, looks pretty cool, you know, kind of a rainy morning. Um, you know, it's been hot down here in Louisiana, so this kind of gives us that cooler feel. On that note, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed. You know, please like, subscribe, follow. I have a whole bunch of links down below. If you all ever have any questions, you know, let me know. Um, and if there's anything you ever want me to address, comment and whatnot, and I'll try to address it. So I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, thank you. Special shout out to Razatron. If you want to check him out on uh, Instagram. He is, let me get his Instagram up. If you type in R-A-Z-Z, -Z, it'll pop up. It's, um, and he's been, um, yeah, Razatron underscore art. And I think he's also been having some cool uh, gardening stuff up on his uh, page as well. So on that note, everybody have a great day, and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.